not only did Jesus make a way for us through the cross, but he had also satisfied all our longings because of him and what he did on the cross. We are saved.
Jesus, we thank you for shedding your blood on the cross for our sins. And that we can come and worship because we are redeemed and God is worthy of it. And Jesus, you've made a way to reconcile us to God. Thank you. Thank you for this new year, this new opportunity to to start afresh and to start anew and to worship you in ways we've never experienced before. We ask your blessing on Alliance Church as we begin this new year, this new kickoff. And we will give you the glory because you are worthy, so worthy of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you for coming. We are very glad you're here. And as we, as we step into the rest of this service, I want to give a little bit of a kind of what we're doing and why we're doing it this morning. In this morning, you're going to hear some stories of where we've been in the past year, some of the highlights of what has happened, but you're also going to hear maybe some direction as to where we're going to go. And the reasoning is we're part of this bigger picture. We're part of a Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family. And we use that phrase, it's, it's our national office that has, for a number of years now, has kind of, they've umbrellaed this theme for us. And perhaps you're familiar, perhaps you are not with what Acts 1-8 actually states. And so I want to read it for you as we get started, because what we're going to hear this morning is some examples of how Alliance Church here in this community has been a witness to our community, as well as being a witness to the world outside of our community and the world abroad. But this is what Acts 1.8 says. Jesus' words to his disciples as he's gathered with them before he ascends into heaven, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so what we're going to do is we're going to invite just a couple of ministry heads, which would be Joetta and uh, Pastor Chris in just a moment, and you're going to hear from them a little bit about what's happening. You're going to hear some needs about some of the, the ministry needs that they have with what they're doing, and you're also going to hear the heart behind what it is that drives their ministry. But everything that we do kind of, it falls back into, yes, we're here to worship, connect, serve. That's kind of our core values. But even in the realm of that, what it is, is is we want to be a part of this Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family. And so as a family, we want you to hear what's going on with our family. And so, Joetta, you ready? ready. All right. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, I am Joetta McLean. I am the Director of Children and Family Ministries here at Alliance. And as a ministry for children's ministry, we, our mission is that we may glorify God by introducing kids to Jesus, teaching them to love God and to love others. And how do we introduce God? First and foremost, it's at home. Out of 168 hours, I had to ask my husband how many hours were in a week, 168 hours, the church, maybe on regular attendance, would have four hours a week with your child. So you have 164 hours at home that you are able to influence by praying with them and for praying for others, by reading the the Bible, And I encourage parents or grandparents to find a Bible that kids are passionate about and they are willing to dig into. And if that involves comic books, that is totally okay. Because I have no problem going down and shutting off a light at bedtime when this book is like this over their head. Asking, you know we try to um, let parents know what we're talking about in junior church or what they're going through at Sunday school, um, or even Awana, they bring home verses. And I encourage you as parents and grandparents and friends to ask, what'd you learn about today? Explain it to me. And you would be surprised that you might get a full lesson, and it might take 15 minutes, but you will get some kind of response back. And by singing with the kids, they sing songs all the time and bring that back home with you. 
getting mops. Kids can start when they're in womb all the way through fifth grade. Great way to be connected with Christ there. Having your kids in nursery. Loving volunteers are showing them God's love. Junior church, where a bunch of kiddos are right now. Sunday school and Awana. So why invest in kids? Why kids? I have recently read an article, and it said, it it was really surprising to me. Because we know those who follow Christ as a child are more, more likely to follow Christ as an adult. And the study that I had read said that if a child had two parents who were regular attenders and were highly active in the church, the child was 93% more likely to follow Christ as an adult. The very flip side of that is if a child only had one parent who attended irregularly and wasn't active, that dropped that percentage to 6%. That's crazy. And there was only two factors in that study, attendance and being active. Each of our children have an opportunity to go out and be disciples for Christ. I was just thinking about my kids, and I was thinking about everyone that they interact with every day. So I thought, 35 kids on the bus, and I've seen that bus. That is probably a low estimate. How many kids does a bus hold? What was that? Did somebody say 70? That's a lot of kids. So I I guesstimated 35. 20 kids are class... 20 so kids are in a class, 100 kids on the playground, 25 kids at after-school events, because you know me, we're always going somewhere. My kids have the opportunity to interact with 180 kids every day. There's days that I only see five people, my husband, my three kids, and the mailman, as they're they're waving. (laughs) So these are our disciples, these kids, because they're out. They are out and about. So why wouldn't you want to be part of this? And what can you do as a parent? A, model Christ's love at home. Encourage your kids. Pray with your kids. And this one might be a hard nut to swallow. But who or what are you making a priority in your home? Because if it's not Christ, you're chasing the wrong nugget. Regular church attendance, regular Sunday school attendance, not only for them, but also for you. Group is showing a great example that you're willing to be there, and as you grow, your kids are going to notice that, and they're going to grow along with you. By attending MOPS or AWANA, get involved by serving in our church, and connect with other church families. And as I was doing this slide... I was like, that is our core values right there. Worship, connect, and serve. But I know some of you are thinking, I don't have, I've grown kids. I've, those are gone. Or I don't have kids. I'm out, right? Don't need that. Each one of us started as a child. Think back to the most influential people in your spiritual journey. And I think we heard that over and over again this year when the individuals were baptized this year. We had people come to Christ through Sunday school teachers, through Awana leaders, through Big Sandy Camp, through a stranger that picked them up and brought them to Awana with them. That's all of us. That can be each one of us. Romans 12, verses 6 through 7 says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift, and there, he lists quite a few, um, is teaching, then teach. If it's cooking, then cook and feed others. If you have a green thumb, then garden. And if you love to organize, I have a spot for you. <laughs> Just come see me. And as a parent, having others invest in our children is priceless. John, you probably don't even know I took this picture. But this is you and Annika Gable. You were just giving her the time of day, and she was gobbling it up. 
So we have many opportunities in children and family ministries to get involved by volunteering in nursery and just rocking and loving up babies, by being a junior church teacher. I mean, those kids love, they eat up whatever you're giving out. They are hungry and thirsty for the word. A Sunday school teacher, we're always looking for Sunday school teachers. A wanna volunteer, a wanna cook. And this is quite the need right now, this year. If you are willing to cook, Awana is looking for someone to help make a meal on a Wednesday. Movie night helper, we have movie nights once a month here at Alliance. It brings in around 60 kids. That's a lot of kids. And I can tell you about 80% of them are not from this church. Friends are bringing friends are bringing friends. And that's a beautiful thing that we get them in this sanctuary. Um, by assisting with family ministry events, if you have loved the pictures, we do a lot of family ministry events. We connect a lot. And there are, there's got to be about a thousand pictures on Facebook. If you ever want a family album, log on to Little Falls Alliance Church on Facebook and you will spend an hour going through pictures. Um, Mops Kids, again, that's a great volunteer need that we have this year. Many moms want in for mops. They, they are thirsty for that growth in Christ, for that fellowship with other moms. We currently have nine moms on our wait list, not because we don't have room as a group, but because we don't have help to care for kids. So if that's something that you're willing to help with, we would love to have you. Vacation Bible School, and so, so many, many, many more opportunities. You just let me know your passion, and I will get you plugged in. Even if it's praying regularly for our children. And you probably didn't know I took this picture either. <laughs> Today's children are tomorrow's future, and that is so important to Christianity. What? I don't know how this slide got in here. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I was thinking this morning as we were worshiping, um, as part of the um, kind of activities that we're going to be doing today, I am all over this cord here, as part of the activities that we're going to be doing today, I'd like to invite you all to head on over to the youth house and take a look at it. Um, there's been a lot of work that's been done there, but even more important than that, I would love, I just think it would be the coolest thing as a church family if after the service, at some point, you have the potential to be here today with activities that are going on through possibly three o'clock with the end of the Packers-Vikings game, and how cool would it be if you could just walk this campus through the children's wing, um, through the, the wing with the offices, the sanctuary here, the youth house, and just take some time to pray for our kids, to pray for our ministry leaders and volunteers, to pray for what's going on here at Alliance Church, and just to Give God the thanks for the facilities that we have and the things that we're doing here and the abilities uh, and just the gifts and talents that we have. I just, I would encourage you, if you have it on your heart at all today, when you're walking through the place, just lift up a, a praise, lift up a prayer, and let's thank God and start off this fall ministry season right. Um, transitioning here. Uh, on our website, I introduce Alliance Youth Ministries by saying, Here at Alliance Youth, it is our desire for students to have a deep and intimate relationship with Jesus. We are able to love others because Christ first loved us. We offer a welcoming environment where students can draw near to Christ and each other through worship, games, and the teaching of biblical truth in large and small group settings. We want to equip you to do the work of God. 
As a leadership team, we seek to embody Ephesians 4.12, which says their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. And we take that very seriously here at Alliance Youth Ministries. Let's take a look here at, there we go, a saturation recap. And the reason I say saturation here instead of teaching or learning is intentional. I don't ever want to teach our students the correct answers. That's not how I operate. If I'm teaching students the correct things to say, then all I'm doing is convincing them on an intellectual level what to repeat back to be correct, so to speak. But God doesn't want the Christian life to be an intellectual exercise. No, he wants us to be saturated. He wants us to be wholly consumed by Christ and his Holy Spirit. So in February, when I came on board, we started by diving into the Gospel of Mark, and we took a look at what discipleship is from Jesus Christ himself, and we walked with him all the way from Bethlehem to Calvary. Then we compounded the momentum we gained from the Gospel of Mark, and we jumped into this summer of discipleship, and we looked at and marinated upon seven core tenets of discipleship that every Christ follower needs, needs to be holistically transformed into the image of Christ in his or her life. We got a new logo. You may have seen it uh, back here at the start. New logo and new scripture as we are um, kind of uh, rebranding a little bit. Uh, here at Alliance Youth. We also invested a significant amount of time, energy, resources, and love into our youth space. Unfortunately, in my excitement to get the updating done this summer, I didn't do a very good job getting the before photos, but rest assured, the the mustard yellow color and the salmon color on the walls, the holes, all the dings and dents, um, they're gone. Uh, Instead of students sitting on the floor, uh, for the most part right now during our small group times, they have furniture and designated spaces uh, to sit upon, and I'm incredibly excited for the space that we have here, and with the addition of the new roof. Thank you for that again. I cannot express my gratitude enough to you all for investing in the next generation of youth here at Alliance Church. I am incredibly excited for the space that we have. We are so blessed at this church to have the facilities that we do. With the resources overview, um, also came a pretty significant restructuring of space allocation during the updates this summer. We now have two designated DIG rooms. DIG stands for Discipleship in Groups. It's essentially uh, my terminology for small groups. Previously, these rooms had seating for two to four students and now have designated seating for up to nine, in addition to Bibles, pens, clipboards, papers, folders, whiteboards, everything that our small group leaders and students need to stay engaged during our DIG time each week. We also have a dual-purpose activity and small group room called the Connection Corner, and previously our basement had a carpet ball game and a broken couch. Um, That was all that was down there. And this summer we were able to acquire from generous donors and my wife's incredibly gifted garage sale bargaining ability, uh, a bunch of new equipment for our youth to use each week. And senior high students are especially going to be able to utilize this space as they're going to have an opportunity every week following community supper from 6.30 to 7 o'clock just to hang out in the basement before their youth group time starts and connect with their leaders and connect with each other. Um, So I'm really, really excited about that. So we installed new carpet in the basement, we patched the wall holes, we repainted the space, and the future wall space is going to be filled with scripture, Tozer quotes, Simpson quotes, um, so that we are completely saturated wherever we look in that space um, with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm really excited for the future uh, here at Alliance Youth. So our underground uh, church worship space got a new TV, um, new carpet as well, um, updated music equipment and lighting, a new seating arrangement, and several other updates are planned in the future to make that space an awesome place to worship. I'm excited about that, too. Our upstairs living room or upper room. I like corny names. I just like corny names. I love acronyms, too. If you spend any time around me, I absolutely love acronyms. You're going to see one here in a minute. Um, But we added a 50-inch TV, increased the seating from 9 to 18, added a whiteboard and other Bible study resources so that space is now a viable teaching space on Wednesdays and Sundays or for whatever we need. Adults would be able to utilize that space, too. It is multipurpose, and I love it. Um, As part of the ministry restructure focus that we're doing here, uh, I am implementing a five-focus approach to ministry that I'm calling the DIME concept because I like corny acronyms. It's awesome. Uh, It's rolling out this fall. I'm going to touch briefly on where we're going with each of these different ministry arms in a moment. But before I go there, I'd like to say that I'm being intentional this year about engaging our leaders and our students Uh, several of our students in initiatives I'm calling LEAD and RECON, again with the acronyms, um, with the goal being to provide leadership and self-leadership training, encouragement, affirmation, and discipleship. I'm very excited about the direction this is going as we're going to be rolling this out this fall, but none of this would be possible without a clear mission and vision. 
Our mission here at Alliance Youth Ministries, we exist to empower students and their families to surrender to God by embracing a lifestyle of worship, connection with others, and service to the world. And I do not think it is a coincidence that this mission aligns with the overall mission of Alliance Church. Um, as I, I took several weeks earlier this spring and prayed through this, and I was listing a whole bunch of stuff, and I realized one day as I was looking at everything, I'm like, huh, that's the overall church's mission. That's pretty cool. You heard Joetta say it before. I do not think it's a coincidence that our different ministry arms align with the core values here at Alliance Church. The vision that we have here, it is the vision of Alliance Youth Ministries to live out the Great Commission. We do this by coming together and following Christ through worship, connection, and service. We seek to always, in every circumstance, live out the gospel. We seek to embody the ideals of a Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family, and in doing so, present a welcoming environment where Jesus is glorified through our words and actions. Church, in our lives, we draw near to Christ and each other as we surrender to biblical truth, obey the leading of the Holy Spirit, and engage in a lifestyle of worship, fellowship, and service to the world. And with that, this fall, I'm embarking upon a personal journey to identify six to eight personal and ministry core values that will shape everything we do at Alliance Youth here over the next three to five years. The first step of that comes from John 3, 35. You see it on the screen there, and I'm going to be preaching a message from this scripture next week, so I'm not going to spoil anything for you here this morning, um, but I want to look briefly at the dime concept uh, as we uh, finish up here this morning. But please be in prayer. Um, for me, for Ryan, for Joetta, as we think about implementing these missions and visions, please be in prayer um, for us uh, as a leadership team uh, so that we can always be surrendering to God in his spirit in everything we do. So the first thing here is dig groups. They exist to stop programming for one week a month and to allow students to be students. Um, that's really the idea behind them. I want to allow them to engage in relationship with one another and their leaders and do life together off, off campus in the context of the rest of the world without any agenda except to conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have impact nights. That's the I in our dine concept. Impact nights will typically take place on the last Wednesday of the month. Our students need to hear the truth. And they need to find the courage to invite their not yet saved friends to hear that same truth. One of the things we're going to be talking about this Wednesday as we do our fall ministry kickoff is how our students are actually embarking upon a nine-month mission trip as they seek to impact their campus for Jesus Christ this school year. Impact nights are going to be more evangelistic in nature, and I'm incredibly excited about those. Uh, midweek is what we refer to when we talk about Wednesday night ministry in any form. So dig groups fall under that. Impact nights fall under the umbrella of midweek. We're splitting the grades this year. I mentioned it earlier. Junior high are going to be meeting from 530 to 7, senior high from 7 to 830. I have about 100 reasons uh, why I'm really passionate about doing this split. I know I've spoken about it from the pulpit here before. I've spoken to many of you individually. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns at all, track me down after the service, and we can talk through uh, some of those those things there. This week in midweek, we're going to be embarking upon a lengthy journey where we discover and trace the thread of Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. So this journey is going to include various smaller units and topics like healthy relationships and other things that students need to hear about in light of living a gospel-centered life. Um, but I'm incredibly excited about this. I'm anticipating that this series that we're embarking upon is going to span two years as we go through the Old Testament this year and the New Testament next year, and I'm pumped up about seeing Jesus all the way through the scriptures with our students. Um, events, so that would be the E in our uh, dime there. Um, we have so many events, I can't list them all. This is just what I thought of off the top of my head when I was typing up uh, this slide here. I want students involved, and my eventual hope through our recon student ministry is that we will have students plan an adults program, especially regarding events. If you haven't already picked up a fall calendar, um, I have them outside my office over there. Um, we've got uh, it listed on the website. You can see me, and we can get you hooked up with anything that you need in regards to our schedule this fall. Our concept uh, classes on Sundays were also going to be split this year. So concept is the uh, name that I coined for our Sunday morning ministry, and it comes uh, based upon A.W. Tozer's quote there that Christianity at any given time is strong or weak depending upon her concept of God. Essentially what Tozer is saying is that our concept of God is going to influence how we walk 
Um, Pete Ring is going to be uh, teaching our junior high to start the year this year um, as they meet starting next week from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. in the youth house uh, through the book of Acts as they dive deeper into the discussion about the weekly sermon. And senior high students are going to be attending the adult worldview class that I'm going to be teaching in the old sanctuary starting next week as well. And I want to stress this to you adults. This is an adult class this worldview class that's going to be starting next week. It's an adult class. It is not a student class that you can come uh, and feel like things are getting diluted for you. Our students need to learn to integrate into the wider body of Christ. And our adults need to be trained to see our students as valuable contributing members of the wider body of Christ. So this is an opportunity for our older students to be stretched and to grow and maybe get a little bit uncomfortable alongside adults this fall, and I'm excited about that. So five primary ways that you can stay connected with Alliance Youth. If I get a hold of your email, you can be involved in our AIM Weekly Top 5 Announcements list. This might have things that aren't on the website because it's more current um, than what uh, we post as the overall calendar for some of the things that might not make it on there. You can also connect with us on Remind. You can connect with us on Instagram. You can connect with us on Facebook. And the website is kept up to date for everything that's going for each particular season. And if you cannot stay connected through one of these five avenues, I don't know that I can help you. But um, continue to uh, stay engaged, continue to stay connected, continue to stay young, and let's continue to pray for our students and our leaders as we embark upon this fall ministry season. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Can I have a clicker? Thank you. It is a pleasure, and I'm not just saying that to work with both Joetta and Chris. Um, it's, it's interesting. Pete Ring doesn't usually like me to quote him, but I'll quote him. Um, so he comes in sometimes, occasionally throughout the week, and if he comes in on a Wednesday, that's our staff meeting, and he usually refers to them as our laugh meeting because we do have a good time as a staff. Um, just kind of an interesting side note from what he has noticed even in the capacity in that way. So we are part of the Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family, and we will hold to that. You know, it's a, it's a beauty in the Great Commission. We've heard both Joetta and Chris talk about this idea of this Great Commission. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. But specifically, I just I want us to look at this one verse. We're going to start a series in Acts. Uh, next week is Youth Sunday. The following week, we're going to actually get into the book of Acts. To get started today, I'm actually going to backtrack a little bit and look at the end of the Gospel of Luke. Because Luke was the same author in both the Gospel of Luke as well as Acts. And so we want to touch on that, see where he left off. Because even as we get into the book of Acts, he's going to revert back to what it is that he talked about in his Gospel. And it's really interesting. Um, and you may or may not be aware of this, but as you looked at and heard what Joetta and Chris were talking about and our core values to worship, connect, and serve, both of them were threaded throughout what it is that they shared. But even more so was this idea, and I don't know that either of them used the word, but the word is witness. And both we saw with what Joetta shared and with what Chris shared are so paramount that we're basically creating, do you want to use the word disciple? Uh, we heard followers of Christ being used. All of that's accurate. But, but there's a call to the church to be a witness. Uh, we are witnesses to our children. Uh, Joetta talked about it beautifully with the idea of our kids going onto the bus and hitting 35 kids there, 20 kids in their classroom, 100 kids on the plate. I mean, we have a witness. Whether you acknowledge it or not, you have been called to be a witness. I want to take a little bit of a closer look at that. We're going to flip it. And we're going to use a word on that. just like that's going to make you feel really uncomfortable because we don't want to be that. But we're going to see in its original context, that's what the word really was and that's what the word meant. And I don't want us to get hung up on the negative piece of it. I want us to be able to step back and say, like, oh, okay. And I want us to get to this point where as we start embarking in this book of Acts, like, I'm part of this. I'm part of something bigger. I have a role in something bigger. You heard a lot of different ways that people can get involved. I want us to be involved. Some of you may be going, I'm not ready to be a witness. You're more ready than you realize. Because sometimes maybe we don't understand what role that can maybe take and be. Okay, so we're going to look at this a little bit. So let's, as, as we get started here, <clears throat> Jim Elliott. Perhaps you've heard of this man named Jim Elliott. Jim was a missionary. He was a missionary in a... He started, he went to 
uh, basically Ecuador, Quito, Ecuador, in February 21st of 1952. He's relatively fresh out of college. He was in his early 20s. He goes into Quito, Ecuador. He wants to, to minister to the Quechua people. It's a tribe in Ecuador. And so he goes in. There was a ministry that was already established there. He goes in there, and he's working with the missionaries there. He gets married a year after he's been there to a woman named Elizabeth. Some of you know his story. Some of this is maybe you're just not aware of it. Either way, it's just fine. So he goes in there. This is Jim. And as he's there, well, it wasn't very long before he becomes burdened while he's in Quito about another tribe. The Waka tribe was there, and this Waka tribe was actually attacking and killing some of the people from the Quechua tribe. And, this, and Jim, instead of like trying to resist this other tribe that's attacking his people, actually has a heart and has a burden for these people. And so it's a number of months that they end up taking, and they, they fly these aviation missions, and they do these package drops. They start dropping gifts to this violent tribe. It's a tribe, basically, that's all about killing other people. And he starts dropping off these gifts, and so they fly over, and then several months into it, they feel like, okay, we think we've built enough rapport. It's time for us to go. So he, along with four other people, one of them being the pilot of the plane, they, they fly into the area of this other tribe. And they're supposed to be in radio contact, and they're supposed to go in, make contact with this tribe, and and come back out. It gets to be late. And the wives of these four men haven't heard anything. And it gets to be later, and they still haven't heard anything. It gets to be later. The next day, they send another missionary pilot in to go and look for them. And they see the plane, and they can see the plane's been badly damaged. And they go in, and then they find the bodies of these five missionaries who were all killed because of their burden for this tribe. Was it a mistake? It sure seems like it, at least to the culture, to the world, that maybe, well, you, you messed up, you goofed up. It's difficult for us to say, but what is beautiful about it is that the wives, Elizabeth in particular, continued the ministry to those people that killed her husband and the husbands of these other wives. And now, even some of those people, those murderers, came to know Jesus Christ, and they've actually started a flourishing church there. I don't want to speak out of turn, but I believe Val Huffman has made contact, knows some of those missionaries in that capacity. You can ask her. Maybe I'm way off on that, okay? But engage in that conversation after church. What an amazing story. But this, this is a situation. We look at Jim, and we look at these, these four others, and we, we call them martyrs. You know, but there's other martyrs. So we have Jim Elliott. We have Polycarp. Polycarp was believed to be one of the disciples of John, the gospel writer, the, John the Revelator. He was believed to be one of John's personal disciples. And so this is early, early church stuff here. Well, it was, he was one of the ones that was credited with actually collecting some of these original New Testament writings and kind of starting to, to pull them together in what becomes some of our New Testament. You know, so this Polycarp, and he was very passionate about it. It's no no wonder if you're following in the footsteps of John, and John was was, uh, one of the disciples of Christ, that he would, in a sense, follow that, which again goes back to some of this, what Chris and Joetta had said, how we engage this younger culture, and we want to bring them up its witness. And so anyway, Polycarp would not... He refused to offer incense to the Roman emperor. And so then Polycarp was taken, and he was burned at the stake. Well, that didn't kill him. And so then after he had been burned at the stake, then they impaled him with with spears and knives, whatever the case is. They stabbed him to death, basically. He's a martyr. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wasn't necessarily martyred for, for speaking Christ, but he was martyred for, because of his faith in Jesus Christ, was standing against the, the German rulers and the German-initiated um, Holocaust. Okay? He was very much against the Holocaust and the killing of the Jews, and so he, he resisted it. He, he had uh, efforts to oppose it, and because of that, he was hanged. Ironically, it was just days before the liberation of Germany that he was hanged. A martyr. 
Stephen, perhaps you're familiar with it. If you're not, we will be engaging in the story of Stephen in a number of weeks as we look at the book of Acts. Stephen was one of the ones he wouldn't stop preaching Christ. Even so much to the point where these, these leaders are looking at Stephen, they, they say, stop it. And he says, I can't stop. I can't stop. And so because of the fact that he would not stop preaching about Jesus Christ, they actually stoned him to death. He's a martyr. John the Baptist. Okay? Obviously, he preached Christ before Christ, you know, while Christ was still here, before he died. And in that process, he actually has his head cut off. Okay? We look at him and we call him a martyr. Peter. Uh, church tradition holds that he was crucified upside down. Same thing. Follower of Christ. Would not stop teaching. Andrew. Likewise, was crucified. Paul, John, arrested for their faith. George and Ringo, I don't think they were included in that. I wasn't sure, so I figured I'd add them just to, just to see where we were at with that. But here's the idea. Oh, it went too far. Back up one. There we go. A martyr. Here's the definition. English definition of the word martyr. We have a noun, we have a verb. The noun, a person who is killed because of their religious or other beliefs, saints, martyrs, and witnesses of the faith. Okay? We understand that. That fits everything that we just talked about with all these people. Verb, to be martyred. Okay? To kill someone because of their beliefs. She was martyred for her faith. Synonyms, put to death, kill, make a martyr of, burn, burn at the stake, stone, throw to the lions. Even some of these Old Testament people. Remember Daniel? We just talked about that recently. Crucify, put on the rack. That's, the, that, that's how we understand what martyr is. And it's interesting, we look at this idea, and we see why Jim was willing to do what he did. This was written in, in the journals from Jim Elliott. It was found after he had died. And he writes, and it's written, it read from his, his journal, he says, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. And it's a beautiful piece of scripture. He, it was, as, as Jim was looking at Luke chapter 9, this is what he was inspired to write, and it fits so well. It says, for whoever wants to save his, their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words and the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. What if... I told you that the word that is used in the New Testament for witness, okay? We just read it here in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, and you will be my witnesses. What if I told you that that word, every time it's used, what if I told you the word testify and testimony, every time it's used in the New Testament, is all incorporated with one root word. That root word is martyr. I mean, it kind of changes the way we look at the... Because we separate the two, right? We separate the two and we think, okay, a martyr is someone who dies for their faith. A witness is just someone who talks about their faith. I'm much more willing to be a witness than I am willing to be a martyr. Let's be honest, okay? I can live with this choice. You know what I'm saying? Because this choice, I'm pretty much guaranteed death. See, You see the difference? And so this idea of witness, and, and I want us to get a little bit beyond because, let's be honest, we don't want to be martyred. I don't believe Jim Elliott wanted to be martyred. I don't know that I believe that Polycarp wanted to be martyred. All right? Now, perhaps they were, obviously, they were willing to die for their faith, but I think that they wanted more to express their faith in Jesus Christ. We are called to be his witnesses. I want to share a story. So we're going to look at, at the Gospel of Luke, just the ending part of it. There's 24 chapters in the Gospel of Luke. Just before Jesus raises, it's, or uh, ascends into heaven, rather, it's after he is raised from the dead, we find this story of when he appears to these two men walking on the road on the way to Emmaus. They're about seven miles away from Jerusalem. And the Bible says that these two men are, are walking and they're talking. And they're talking all about the events that have happened over the past week. They're talking about this Jesus of Nazareth and I can envision them talking amongst themselves. Oh, man, remember, remember when he came into Jerusalem? You know, he was riding on that, that colt. People were laying the palm branches down. People were laying their coats down. We were so convinced that was gonna, it was all going to be different. We thought that was the moment that Jesus was going to reset and restore Israel back into its place of prominence, that we weren't going to be under the Roman rule anymore. We thought that that was the moment. You can see them discussing it. Now they're downhearted. 
because everything that they had hoped for was suddenly gone. And as they're walking, and the Bible says, as they're walking and they're talking about these things, Jesus appears to them and he says to them, what are you talking about? I think I have some of these verses up here. I don't remember which ones I have or not. So I'm going to tell the story. We may backtrack a little bit. So he says, what are you talking about? And I can just envision them saying like, where have you been? You know, who are you and how do you not know? This has been the talk of the town for the last week. Probably even more so because Jesus for Months, three years worth of ministry had really become known as to, wow, what is it with this guy? He's been the talk of many people's, on on many people's lips throughout. And now all of a sudden, he's gone, he's been killed, they know the story, and they're talking about the story. Let's look at what we have here. So as they were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and they discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself appears before them and basically says, what are you guys talking about? Okay? What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? Are you you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know these things? In other words, what he's basically saying is, not only do you not live here, are you just visiting here? And in fact, even the visitors here to Jerusalem know what's going on. It's like, has your head been in a hole? Have, have you not, are you not on Facebook to know what's happening? I mean, are you not socially connected? Are you, are you so disconnected? Like, what is wrong with you? Are you the only one that doesn't know what's going on? That's which is an ironic question because Jesus knows what's going on way more than this guy. So, okay, just, just an interesting irony. And Jesus goes on, he says, what things? In other words, tell me. What is it, these things that you're talking about? And they said, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. And they go on to say, it's about Jesus of Nazareth, and they give the description, he was taken, he was killed, he was crucified, and we don't know what to do. We had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. That's, that's what we were clinging to. We believed it, we had hoped for it. And what is more, it is the third day since it all took place. If you remember the story, this was a number of years, or probably years, I suppose now, we went through the Gospel of John. And as we went through the Gospel of John, we came to this fascinating passage where this man, Lazarus, is killed, or, okay, or dies, rather, he dies of sickness. And while he's there, he's in the tomb, and Jesus waits before he comes in. Right? And Jesus was told, hey, Lazarus is sick. He's your friend. He's like, yeah, I know, but we're going to wait here until he's really dead, dead. Okay? So he goes in. It's been actually four days, and so make sure that there is no life in him anymore. And well, we know reality. He was dead. He's, he's not coming back. But they believed in this culture that basically after three days, the spirit left him, and there was no longer any hope. You follow? I mean, it's just like, he's gone. Right? And so they said, it's been three days. In other words, there's no hope anymore. He's not coming back. He's definitely gone. In addition, this was just through them. So these guys are talking. He's dead, dead. He's been gone three days. He's not coming back. But in addition, some of our women amazed us, and they, they went to the tomb early this morning. It's the same day that Christ had, had res- resurrected, and they didn't find his body. Did you notice they said, and they, he's resurrected. They didn't say that. He said, then they can't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. I mean, this is like, what do you make of this? Then some of our companions went to the tomb, and they found that it was right, that that what these women had said was actually true. But they did not see Jesus. And he said to them, this is Jesus' words to these two, Cleopas being one of them, they're walking on the road to Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. And Jesus goes on to start to teach them. And he says, how foolish you are and how slow to believe that all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and enter into his glory? I love the fact that he uses himself in the third, third person there. You know, Did not the Christ, did not the Messiah have to do this? He hasn't revealed himself to them yet. But then we, he goes on and he tell, it says that he tells the whole story of all the prophets. Everything these prophets have said about him, in a sense, he lays it all out for them. They get to this point where Jesus is ready to go on to the road, and they encourage him. They say, no, it's late. It's getting dark. Why don't you stay with us? And so Jesus actually stays with him, and then they're gathered together. 
And they're at the table, they're ready to eat, and Jesus takes the bread and he breaks it and he reveals, in a sense, he opens their eyes to who he really is, and this is what we find. He says, when he was at the table with them, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from them. Whoosh. That's creepy. What ends up happening after that? So Jesus disappears from them. These guys, they get up and they leave. And they go back to Jerusalem immediately. They want to go find the, the 11 disciples. So they go back and they engage and they meet with the rest of them. They say, basically, we saw him. You know, you guys said that he was alive. We actually saw him. So they're gathered with their disciples into this room. And that's the moment when Jesus actually reappears in through the locked door, if you will. He appears and he gives them some instructions now. And this is what I want us to grasp. This is what I want us to understand, especially as we engage this book of Acts. And this is where Luke kind of leaves off with this. These are Jesus' words to them. And he says, you are witnesses of these things. You've seen these things. I'm going to send you what my father promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. That's basically the same passage we're looking at in Acts 1.8. Okay? And Luke's going to revisit that as we get going into the book of Acts. But Luke left. He wrote to Theophilus, was the recipient of the letter. He writes to him. It was intended to be read by other Christians as well. He leaves him at that point before the book of Acts comes in. He leaves him with this point. You are to be my witnesses. And likewise, I think that's the challenge for us. We are to be his witnesses. And we look at the idea of witnesses, and sometimes we're intimidated by that. Sometimes we're scared by that. Sometimes I just like, I have nothing to say. I don't know how to talk about my faith. Talking about... Jesus is one thing. It's a good thing. And I think it is one form of witnessing, but there's other forms as well. Joetta honestly shared some of them in her list of needs because cooking for someone is a way to witness and express the love of Christ. You you hear that? I'm not not diminishing. I'm not trying to to make it less. It's It's powerful. Visiting someone in the hospital is a way to witness the love of Christ. Caring for children while moms get their spiritual and emotional tanks filled during a mops meeting is a way to witness the love of Christ. You see that? I, it is a, there's so many ways. and that, that I'm not trying to say we don't want to go out and share because that's a huge part of it. What I want to kind of wrap it up with here, a couple of things I want us to look at. I think I got Acts 1. No, oh, back up. And there it is. It says, but you will receive power. So then what, what we're going to find, we're going to start, as we get started, we're going to look at this again the next time we gather and we look at Acts. But it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the very ends of the earth. Everything we're doing here is about worship, connect, serve. Everything is intended to bring it in and how we can take and be witnesses in this capacity. We have a community right now. We've talked openly about it. We have a number of refugees coming into our community and we have been called to be a witness. We've been called to be a witness to our Jerusalem And then in a sense, most of us would look at this. The idea of it is you have a bullseye, if you will. And we'll look at this again in a couple weeks. We have this bullseye, Jerusalem. That's where the disciples were intended to stay, right there in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came on them. And then they were intended to go out. So they have a responsibility. They have a ministry to their Jerusalem. We have a ministry here. We have a responsibility with our children here, with each other here. We have a responsibility to witness here. But you also have a responsibility to outside of this. You have areas of Judea. That's basically the, the city of Little Falls. And then you have Samaria, maybe the state of Minnesota. And maybe the, to the very ends of the earth, that's global. And the alliance embraces that. We are all about that. We want that. We want to be a part of that Acts 1-8 family. That's not only broad, but it's also here as well. And there's a beauty in that. And we're called to be witnesses across the board for that. Not just in one or the other, but in all. And so we will be witnesses. And in that capacity, what we're finding, which is just a unique situation, is we have the Lord is literally taking the ends of the earth. It's like he's picking them up and he's placing them in our back doors. You follow? Because we have refugees coming into this community. 
they, many of them don't know the language. You know, we've talked about it. We're going to be, we don't know how we're doing it. We're working on learning how to do it, but we are going to be engaging in a ministry there as far as uh, English as a second language. The Lord has provided people that are going to help make that happen. It's nothing that we've gone and recruited for. It's what the Lord has done, and there's some really cool things happening. Witnesses. Okay? Likewise, we have witnesses to our children. We have witnesses to the parents that are bringing and dropping off Awana kids. You have a witness to who it is you go to school with. You have a witness to who it is you work with. You have a witness to who it is uh, that's, I'm going to say this, but I don't mean it this way, checking you out at the grocery store. Okay? Yeah, that can be taken in the wrong way. Okay, I don't mean it in the wrong way. I mean, it's like, so you're at the grocery store. How you interact there is a big deal. I am ashamed sometimes of how I interact with people. <sighs> but the Lord is gracious. So here's where I want to wrap up. I believe the Lord has given us everything that we need to be a witness. We look at this story with these two men on the road to Emmaus, and God has given them everything that they need to be a witness. First thing he does is he gives them a story. And they share the story. What did they do when, when they had that happen with Jesus? What did they do? They left Jerusalem and they went to tell the others. Okay? They had a story and they wanted to tell their story. It's like, this is crazy. Just uh, not putting anyone under pressure. I'm just curious. How many read the email that I sent out yesterday? Oh, not bad. Okay? That's the point where something, something unique happens to you. You can't help but share the story. We share hunting stories. We share fishing stories all the time. That's fine. I think they're fun. I enjoy that. You have something odd that happens to you, get this. Get with someone else. You share the story. Likewise, you have been given a story. You know, I can't tell you how many times, especially doing student ministries, people, you know, students are like, you ask you, you got to share your testimony. It's like, oh, I don't really have a testimony. Yes, you do. You just have to share it. And they're so adamant. It's like, I don't have nothing to say. I don't have a very good testimony. The point of it is you have a story to share. That's, that is what you ought to do. You know, Jesus is not sitting idle, not transforming you. He wants to transform you, but we do have the responsibility. And let's say, okay, Lord, I need you to transform me. We just dealt with five, six weeks of that, Okay. We have a story. These two men had a story. All we're saying is, what Jesus has given them is a story to share. And then what did he do? He gave them people to share the story with. Right? You have the, the disciples. They go in and share that. But there's others. They go and they share the story. Luke was not one of the disciples. And yet we have it written here. So obviously Luke, someone shared the story with him. You follow? So not only do you have a story to share, you have people to share the story with. This is witnessing. This is very verbal. But it's not just verbal, because you guys are on social media, right? You're not always using words. You're not always writing things. But the imagery that you convey through social media is a witness. You follow that? Powerful images. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. I think today's culture, probably even more. You have images that convey a witness. So let those images convey a witness that glorifies Christ. You hear that? That's beautiful. What a responsibility, what a beautiful opportunity to have. So he's not only given us a story, he's given us people to share uh, the witness with, but the most important one is what we just looked at. He has given you the power of the Holy Spirit. You have received the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, you have spiritual gifts. That's all part of the Holy Spirit. So I'm not trying to separate and make one way or the other. It's kind of all encompassed in one. You've been given the power of the Holy Spirit. And look at a couple of these verses. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit himself, testifies with our spirit. Do you hear that? The Holy Spirit, along with you and your story, are designed to basically help present that witness, and they work together. That's pretty cool. The Holy Spirit wants to work with you and your giftedness and your personality to be able to convey you are a witness and he just wants to use you in that way. Paul says, I speak the truth in Christ. In other words, I'm not going to stay silent about that. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. In other words, the, the point of it is, you may feel like as you're witnessing, it's like, I'm not doing the right thing. If you're saying, Lord, I want this to be the right thing, I'm submitting to your Holy Spirit as a, as a witness, I believe the Holy Spirit is going to take care of that. Okay? I don't think we should be afraid of making mistakes. I've made lots of mistakes. I made a mistake about a week and a half ago. I was just ashamed of myself with my attitude towards someone else. It wasn't anyone part of the church. It was someone in the community, and I was so mortified. And I shared it with, with one, of, one of the former elders, in it, and he was just gracious. He says, you know, the way you responded, because I did. I apologized. It's like, but I just wish I hadn't gone there first, you know. I apologized, and he said, you know, that probably spoke more. Maybe, 
but why couldn't I love the guy first? And likewise, it's a witness. Yeah. And so I, I can look at that, that example, I can look at that situation, and I can just go like, what? Lord, I messed up, but your grace is good. So let me be, let that moment even be a witness. Okay, I don't know what I've got left here. That's that same verse. We looked at that before, kind of wrap up. Uh, I think I have a quote. And this is Jim Elliott again. This is where I'm going to kind of clo- close and we'll kind of pray and wrap it up here. But I love, this is also a quote by Jim Elliott. And I think this fits us. This fits the church. Because wherever you are, you know, sometimes we look at, well, you can only be a missionary if you go overseas. That's not true, especially in today's culture, okay? You can only be a witness if you go overseas. That's not true. Wherever you are, be all there. I believe looking around here, most of you are, are from this area. So the Lord has, has placed you, and we look at the idea of Esther and for such a time as this, the Lord has placed you where you are to be a part of this Christ-centered Acts 1-8 family for a purpose, and that is to be a witness for him. We know that throughout the scripture. We get that. Okay? That's not saying, oh, well, you got to get perfect first, and then, then you can be a witness. Baloney. All right? Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. In other words, here it is. Be be fully in. Be all in. Be where you are as a witness for the sake of Christ. That's a beautiful commission. That is the great commission. Just spelled out maybe in a little bit of a different way because we're all part of that acts. It's a Christ-centered Acts 1A family. Uh, I'm going to invite Lane and the worship team to come up. And we're going we're gonna to worship. And then when we are done, we are going to transition. Um, I'll give an announcement maybe at that time so as to not change what we've got going on here. here. So let's worship together. This last song we're going to sing is called How He Loves, and uh, it's an old one that we've sung for many years, and, and I'm sure you know it, but if you've never heard the story behind the song, go and search on Google, YouTube, um, How He Loves, story behind the song, something like that, and it'll tell you something like we heard today about Jim Elliott and, and others who have died being a witness for Jesus. So let's stand and sing this last song.
that you have been called to be his witnesses and that you are to be fully involved in where he has placed you to be, to be his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the very end of the earth. And what a beautiful thing is that we get to do that together. I'm going to pray, and then I want to give some instructions as to what we got going on for the rest. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. You are magnificent. Open our eyes and help us to see your magnificence. And if we're feeling perhaps, Lord, I just, I don't have a, I don't have a witness, I don't have a testimony, then perhaps we haven't seen our own depravity to know that which your grace has saved us from. So if that's the case, then Lord, I pray that you're, the beauty and the heaviness of your grace will rest on our minds and our, we, our eyes will be open to see that. But likewise, I ask that you will help us to understand that we have a witness. Pro- proclaim the name of Christ with our words, our interactions, to take the story that you have placed us in and the people you've placed into our story and the power of your Holy Spirit to express your amazing love and your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I have been informed. The food is ready. And so here's what I'd like to ask for help as well as encouragement to you. You can, when you leave, you can get right into line and get some food. If you are able-bodied, Uh, male or female, we would like to create some space in here so that once people get their food, they could come in here with some tables. We have tables in the closet just behind Chris uh, Haraco there, and we have some tables in the...